I'm Dr. Renee Melfi. Thank you for coming tonight. We're competing with a few things, the impending snowstorm, which I very much appreciate everyone coming, and an FU game. <laughs> so, um, but first, really, I want to thank Wendy Meyerson and Nature Time because it really is a fantastic community service that she performs by, by offering these opportunities. So uh, we're very lucky to have this in our area. A few years ago, I did the... Um, Customer Appreciation Day, and there were customers from all over New York State coming to this uh, store. So. so I'm local. I was uh, uh, born and raised here, went to uh, West Hill, and then I moved away really for all of my education. Uh, uh, my college residency uh, fellowship in uh, spine and musculoskeletal, and then I moved back uh, to be close to family. Um, I'm certified in physical medicine, pain medicine, um, integrative medicine, and, and I'm also certified in New York State in medical acupuncture. So um, many people have actually not heard of the medical specialty physical medicine and rehabilitation, or we're also called physiatrists. Um, we are a specialty that deals uh, with um, restoring and maximizing function and independence in patients who have had any type of either temporary or permanent uh, disability resulting from injury or illness. Our focus really is on optimizing function and maximizing quality of life. Um, I've sort of branched out, and uh, as I just mentioned, in ter terms of my certifications, I really do wear uh, many hats, and we'll touch on uh, a few of them tonight. Um, I'm a allopathic uh, medical doctor. I'm a specialist in physical medicine and then subspecialized in interventional spine. Um, but probably after about five years of doing very conventional medicine, I found that I was just feeling uh, somewhat dissatisfied and was looking for other ways to treat my patients and um, started studying integrative medicine um, and how that applies to my population with, of patients with pain. Um, so uh, in that regard, I reached out and learned acupuncture, um, supplementation for pain, nutrition, um, and then in about 2014, um, I expanded into regenerative medicine. Um, so I think really the most important part of physicians in general is that we uh, really should be a partner in your health and wellness and you have an active role. So in terms of, uh, we're going to split today into two um, different territories, more musculoskeletal and pain, and then the uh, exciting new uh, regenerative aesthetic and sexual health uh, type of procedures. So I'll start with musculoskeletal. Um, that is your system involving bones, uh, muscles, ligaments, tendons, nerves, um, and they're typically um, can be pain arising from injury, uh, uh, overuse disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome for, from typing uh, frequently, or degenerative, which simply is the aging change, changes that the body undergoes, and actually that's a normal physiologic process. So what do you do when you first um, hurt yourself? Um, you can experiment to try to find a position that's more comfortable um, and decrease the pain. Um, contrary to what you may believe, don't just rest. Um, you can often get worse that way. Um, you can limit activity, but don't stop activity completely. Um, if you have pain for more than a week or two, you know, then it's a good time to seek care from a physician. You don't want to wait too long um, and develop chronic pain and be laid out like this little guy here. Most important thing is that we should strive to make a diagnosis so that we can do targeted treatment for the um, pain. And in this example, the, the providers are here scratching their head trying to figure out where is this person's pain coming from. Well, I figure that's really my job and I should be able to answer that question for you. Part of the ways that I do that is by doing uh, targeted injections, and that can be spine, uh, it can be joints, muscles, so uh, it can be, uh, be done for various parts of the body. And there's different types of injections, which is very important. I don't want to go too far in depth with this, but uh, there's different goals of injections. Some can be diagnostic, um, this category, where if I put in uh, anesthetic into a structure, 
and it turns all of the pain off, then I've just identified what the pain source is. And then I can do more targeted treatments for that structure, okay? And some of the more targeted treatments usually need to involve some type of therapeutic solution like steroid or some of the things that we'll be talking about tonight like PRP or stem cell. So very important that there are two different goals uh, and roles of injections. Um, we do use um, guidance for performance of injections because that way we can be 100% target specific when performing the injection. So this would be an example of ultrasound to identify the painful structure and guide the needle to the area of the painful structure and this would be x-ray fluoroscopy. So really joint and spine injections, I use x-ray to do that. And that way, as I said, we can be uh, completely precise with the um, placement of the medication. It's well documented in literature that what we call blind injections or injections that are without any type of uh, imaging guidance can miss the target sometimes up to 50% of the time. So. This is what seems to be the current or conventional role of treatment in any kind of musculoskeletal pain. Um, when you hurt yourself or have type of, uh, any type of pain, typically you're given medicines by your, uh, oops, sorry, wrong button. You're given medicines by your provider. Um, they may or may not send you for something like physical therapy or occupational therapy. Often they may tell you to rest or immobilize the structure or use bracing. Often that will lead to surgery to repair or remove the offending tissue. And at some point, they may need to fuse or replace the, uh, the joint. And my suggestion is, is that doesn't need to be the treatment paradigm at this time. Okay, we're moving past that and we have more things to offer. So the, the future of medicine, and, and my claim is that it's here now is that there should be a shift in that paradigm. Instead of removing, fusing, replacing the tissue, we should try to help, sorry, we should try to help the body heal itself. And rege with regenerative injections, we can do that. Right? We use the body's own molecules and chemistry to avoid things like this. Um, and I suggest that we learn from nature, like this little kitty here, uh, she knows what's good for her. The body is the same way. The body knows how to take care of itself and heal itself. And w with these type of procedures, we're just giving it a boost and jump-starting that reaction. So regenerative medicine is where we use the body's own cells to try to enhance uh, the repair mechanisms. It's non-surgical, um, and it's to try to actually heal the source of the pain instead of simply just mask it or band-aid it like we do with a lot of the conventional treatments. Um, so again, what's most important with this, it's non-surgical, which allows you to avoid the long, painful rehabilitation periods that often follow replacements, fusions, and such. Um, there's a very clear safety record because it is your own body cells. There's not really side effects to your own cells. Um, and uh, there haven't been um, any kind of increase in uh, cancers or malignancies with use of, again, your own body products. Um, it's something that's been out there really for decades, uh, and this is the treatment that um, people with uh, resources are choosing. Uh, again, because of those benefits that I just mentioned, especially of avoiding surgeries and long um, rehabilitation periods. It's also used in veterinary medicine, and a lot of the advances in research actually started in veterinary medicine. So um, PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, um, I think probably at this point a lot of people have heard about it. It's, it's out there, it's in the news. Again, all the athletes are having it. Um, it's where we draw a blood from your vein in your arm, put it into a centrifuge, and spin that blood. Okay, and then the blood will separate out, and we're looking for the layer of platelets. So we've, we've used the centrifuge to concentrate that layer of platelets. 
we then use that and inject that into the area where there's injury um, because the platelets will then release growth factors and proteins called cytokines and your body uses that to bring in the ever, all the factors it needs to heal itself. Just like if you fall and scrape a knee and have an open wound, um, it'll start to get that sort of yellow, serous um, fluid over it and then scab over and heal. Same kind of concept. And this is just an example of what happens after we centrifuge and divide out the plasma, um, what's called the buffy coat, which is, ha contains the platelets that we're looking for, and then the red cells. In stem cell therapy, um, specifically what I do in my office, um, is use your body's own stem cells. Um, mesenchymal stem cells secrete molecules, again, to help the body direct itself to repair itself in a more uh, accent, uh, accelerated fashion. These cells can differentiate into other cell types, uh, such as cartilage, ligaments, tendons, muscles, fatty tissue, to try to, again, repair the tissue. You can think of them as the manager or the general contractor that's sort of going into an area and bringing in all the cell types that the body needs to heal itself. And here's an example. There are actually many different types of stem cells and sources. Um, what we're using most often uh, nowadays, autologous means from your own body, which would either be the bone marrow cells that are typically drawn up from your, the back of your pelvis, um, or adipose cells, which are, which are taken from a liposuction. There is some use of commercial products from other sources, and typically uh, that's amnion products. So um, in our office, I do bone marrow aspirate. It is uh, approved by, uh, in that um, use by the FDA because that is a very sensitive subject and some of those things are not approved. Um, then we, I use the same type of process where I put the um, aspirate into the centrifuge to concentrate it and really get as many uh, stem cells as possible and then inject them into the damaged area. Um, and then, as I said, the body will, will those, those uh, stem cells will signal the body uh, to, bring, to bring in the other type of cells that it needs to repair itself. Mm -hmm. Um, what, I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and we'll save that question. We'll come right back to it when we finish, um, but certainly save that question, okay? Um, the, in the case of, of lipoaspirate, again, this is at this point an area of controversy. Um, it can be used um, in this country and approved uh, by the FDA um, if it is used more as a um, scaffolding or for a, a graft um, for structure. It cannot be digested um, to release the stem cells. And this is where the controversy is and it seems that there are some places that are out there doing that. And again, it's not approved by the FDA. So it's something that I just strictly avoid uh, in my office. And I use the bone marrow for the stem cells. Uh, amnion, again, is a very uh, controversial subject. Again, that was from other sources. It is being marketed uh, pretty aggressively in the United States and um, facilities are using it. Um, it is known to not contain any viable stem cells. So we are aware that there are some places that are marketing this type of injections as stem cell injections, and this is where uh, you know, I indicated that I would sort of help you choose uh, what to look for, um, and I would say with this buyer beware, because it, it likely does contain some type of cells can, that can be healing. We're not quite sure what it is that offers relief at this time, but it is not from stem cells. Um, and this really can be used for um, multiple types of indications for musculoskeletal pain, um, whether it's spine, uh, joints, arthritis, sprain strains, tendon ligament tears, and muscles as well. So 
So now we're going to move into the topic of um, regenerative aesthetic medicine, um, which uh, is, I think, new to this area and probably uh, one of the reasons why a lot of folks are here tonight. Um, so what I'm performing is the vampire procedures, um, if anyone has, has heard of that. We're the first office in Central New York to offer the full constellation of all of these type of procedures. I am a licensed provider for the O or orgasm shot, the Priapus shot, vampire facelift, vampire facial, vampire breast lift, and vamp vampire hair growth. Um, I did train with the inventor uh, of the procedures, Dr. Reynolds in Alabama. Um, he used, he coined uh, these uh, procedures with the name vampire simply to um, denote that it was with use of blood or PRP. Um, and he developed these uh, procedures after studying uh, PRP research for about 10 years or so. So you do have to be a licensed provider uh, to be able to perform these procedures because they are trademarked and registered by him. Um, in terms of the vampire facial, uh, that's where we use a microneedling device, um, and in this case, I would use a skin pen, which is FDA approved, um, to create little uh, micropunctures in the skin. And at the same time, uh, we either drip or paint your own blood, your own PRP, which has platelets in it, um, onto the skin, and really the microneedling device will help drive the PRP into the skin. And again, the PRP then <coughs> releases growth factors and proteins um, that your body uses to tighten the skin, rejuvenate the uh, collagen of, on the face. The facelift, uh, again different from the facial, is where we actually use fillers, hyaluronic acid fillers, um, to create shape. Okay, So the facelift is more where we're trying to both improve shape um, and skin. So the filler is used as a scaffolding and then the PRP is actually injected under the skin instead of just being painted onto the skin. Um, and again, it releases the growth factors and cytokines which cause new cell growth. Um, and the, the goal of the facelift would be for a younger shape, a more healthy, natural um, shape and healthy glow. So again, uh, to differentiate the difference between the facial and the facelift, because I do have to tell you when I first went into this course, um, I thought, well, geez, I'd, I wouldn't want a facelift. Um, you know, that seems so drastic, I think. Um, and it took going to the course to understand that really the goal is to just make a more um, natural, younger appearance. Okay, I, I would say that it doesn't cause any of those sort of drastic changes that can uh, happen with a surgical facelift. So um, good uh, indications for the facial uh, would be um, scarring uh, from acne or even trauma, the cray paper that we get under the eyes as we age, fine lines and wrinkles if you're looking to improve the color and texture, um, improve your skin elasticity and firmness, um, and again, we don't use it to change shape. Um, it may be uh, in the case where you already have a beautiful shape. Um, the facelift is where we do want to improve the shape. As we age, we lose fluid in our body. We, you know, dehydrate and <laughs> shrivel and drop a little bit. You know, where the fat atrophies. So as that happens, we sort of hollow out a little bit. Okay. So with that, we're using the filler to try to use, put some of that shape back in plumpness and then the uh, PRP to improve, the, again, the um, elasticity, the, the uh, texture, um, uh, and bring in the cells to help repair. Um, so it does give you an improved shape, um, a lifted face that can soften lines, improve the color and texture, and improve scars. And now moving on to vampire breast lift. Um, this is where um, uh, an anesthetic, and I should mention that a topical anesthetic is used for all of these procedures to improve comfort. Um, and with the use of the anesthetic, um, for instance, when I had a number of these procedures, I, I truly didn't feel that much. If anything, I felt a little bit of pressure. Um, so this is where um, 
the goal again would be to inject the uh, platelets to uh, build new tissue including collagen, fatty tissue uh, for smoothness and blood vessels to improve the skin um, glow and texture. Um, the goal is to produce rounder, more full cleavage. It can be used to improve sensation in the nipples, correct any asymmetries or irregularities in shape, um, can uh, be more safe than implants. It can be used after any type of surgical um, procedure, uh, often to improve shape and irregularities. Um, and filler can be used, again, to try to fill in um, defects and then the PRP layered on top of that. Uh, PRP can be used for hair growth. Um, again, a topical anesthetic is applied to the scalp. Um, one may or may not uh, um, may, may or may not choose to also have anesthetic uh, injected into the scalp as well to numb it up more. Um, when I had it, I didn't. And again, just from the topical anesthetic, uh, I really didn't feel much. Um, the platelets. Uh, will um, allow the follicles, uh, if they're still active, viable follicles, to regrow hair. Um, and a good way to think about it is just thinking about the PRP acting like fertilizer um, for hair regrowth. Um, it's used more for thinning or receding hair. Again, there still has to be some active follicles there. Um, there can be a decent result after one um, injection, but uh, occasionally uh, one does need a series of two or three injections. Uh, typically, it may be more successful for females than males, and if um, results aren't adequate, uh, then occasionally, you know, things like hormone balance need to be looked at. And then on to the uh, sexual health procedures. The O or orgasm shot um, is where an uh, anesthetic is applied um, to the clitoris and uh, vagina. Um, anesthetic is injected into the area of the clitoris, and then the platelet growth factors from PRP are injected into the clitoris and upper vagina. Um, the procedure can help with urinary incontinence, um, libido or uh, sexual desire, um, achieving orgasm, dyspareunia or uh, painful sex, uh, vaginal dryness, interstitial, interstitial cystitis, or uh, scarring or lichen sclerosis. And the pre shot or P-shot, um, same thing, an anesthetic is applied to the penis. Um, one may or may not choose to also have an anesthetic injection. Um, and then a very fine, thin uh, needle is used to um, inject very specific areas in the penis, in the shaft, and then uh, one area in the glands. Um, it's been found there, there can be enhancement of erection, enhancement of sensitivity, um, improvement in size. Um, there is greater success with that after um, uh, uh, immediate use of a pump, and then one is um, encouraged to use a pump at home um, for at least six weeks if, they're, if one is looking for improvement in size. Essentially, it's trying to improve the blood flow, um, and then it can also uh, improve any kind of angulation uh, in the penis that may occur as one ages. So, big question is, well, where, do you, where to go? Um, you all have a choice because these are procedures that typically one is seeking out uh, themselves. Um, so you have to be an educated consumer where you're looking at where to have this procedure done. Um, so, uh, you know, even, even this little guy knows that, you know, he's looking out for himself and he pushed the little chick out of the uh, uh, nest and is uh, seeking, you know, care and comfort. Uh, so I would encourage, you know, to look out for yourself when you're looking for things like this. So how do you make these decisions? You know, most important is not, peer, not all PRP is created equally. Um, there's different types of kits. Uh, there's different spinning protocols. Some PRP might be spun once by a certain facility. Other PRP might be spun twice by a facility, you know, which would concentrate the platelets more. Um, and I have seen this. I've been, you know, doing this long enough that, out of curiosity, I look at other other facilities' notes if someone has had PRP, and I look at the preparation of their PRP, and I see, oh, geez, they only spun it once, so I would expect that to be less concentrated. Um, 
The other issue is that numbing medicines are obviously often uh, a part of injections because we want to make patients more comfortable when we do injections. The problem is with your cells, whether it's your PRP cells or your stem cells, strong concentrations of anesthetics will kill the cells. Um, so there have been studies that identify what concentration of anesthetic or volume that you can use, like lidocaine or novocaine, um, to inject with the cells and the cells will still remain viable. Very important for your provider to know that this research exists because as I've said, I've seen examples where uh, a certain amount of PRP is injected with, with a much higher amount of lidocaine or anesthetic, and there's no chance that the PRP cells could have remained uh, viable with the amount of anesthetic that was used. So your provider must know uh, what's, what they're injecting. Um, and it might be that as a consumer you might want to ask, you know, what, uh, what company are you using to, to uh, your kits? Um, how many times do you spin it? Do you use anesthetics? How much anesthetic do you use? Where have you trained? Uh, how many, what courses have you gone to? How many of these have you done? Um, and the same is the case, again, with stem cells that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I prefer use of, again, autologous cells, which are from your own bone marrow. It is approved in the United States. Um, we know that there are some places where some things are going on that I think are questionable in terms of the use of the fat. Um, and uh, any kind of advertisement of the commercial products, the Amnion products, claiming that they're stem cells, um, certainly um, you know, has been proven in studies that they don't contain viable cells. Um, and again, the numbing medicines can kill the cells. So um, in my office, my facility, um, I've been um, performing injections since 2002, so in that amount of time I've done thousands of injections. Um, in medicine, injections can be done by any type of medical, licensed medical provider. Um, and I guess the example that I can use is if you decided you wanted to have a uh, beautiful custom kitchen cabinetry built, you would hire a cabinet maker. You wouldn't hire a carpenter, okay, because there is a difference in expertise and training. Um, and I would uh, submit that, you know, interventionalists are the people who train to do injections. This is what we do. Um, while many other providers are allowed to perform injections, this is what we did specific training to do. Um, I also do, um, I'm a teaching uh, instructor for several national spine organizations, so I actually teach other uh, uh, physicians how to do injections. Um, additionally, certainly in any of the musculoskeletal injections, um, I use the x-ray or ultrasound guidance uh, so that I can have precision placement of the medication. I'm fellowship trained. Um, because of my other certifications, I try to tie in uh, holistic medicines and uh, suggestions for things like supplements uh, or nutrition um, to my treatment plan. And we're a very small office. You know, these days that's pretty rare in medicine. So um, I'm the physician who performs all of the procedures. Um, I have a, a part-time uh, PA, uh, primarily to see follow-ups and a small um, personal um, office staff. So typically you come in and you see the same person all the time and you know everyone's names and you know we know about your families and what you do with, for hobbies. Um, so I, I think it's um, you know lovely nowadays to find that in an office. So in terms of uh, biologic healing, um, we're on our way. Uh, we have a lot uh, farther to go in terms of research, but I think that certainly this is going to replace many of the uh, type of treatments um, that we're currently performing. And that's it. 